Obesity in early childhood and adolescence. Uh, we've heard some public health approaches to obesity and diabetes and some uh, individual uh, approaches. Uh, and uh, well now we're going to turn our attention a little bit to perhaps what we might do with that 160 kilogram person where the two kilogram weight loss that we see from our lifestyle interventions perhaps isn't going to cut mustard uh, and we need something a little bit more dramatic than that. Uh, so we're going to have a little bit of a, a think and a talk about bariatric surgery. Uh, so it's a real honour and a privilege to introduce uh, our speaker, uh, next speaker, Rachel Batterham, who's uh, come all the way from London. And uh, we've made her work uh, for her uh, trip to New Zealand, and I'm not sure that she's seen terribly much of New Zealand. Um, she arrived in the country on Wednesday, and I immediately flew her down to Wellington on Thursday morning to give two talks for me down there. Uh, she had no choice in the matter, of course, um, and uh, has come back up. And Rachel's just arrived back from doing an interview with Kim Hill, so she's been very busy, uh, but uh, very much looking forward to um, her talk. Um, I introduced Rachel uh, to our research team in Wellington as Mrs. PYY, uh, so you'll hear and understand what I mean by that in a moment. So, Rachel. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to fly around New Zealand and not see anything of it just yet. Okay, the other thing I have to warn you is it's 2.30 in the morning my time, so I'm going to try and keep energetic to keep myself awake as well as you. So I'm going to talk more broadly about harnessing the gut to treat obesity and type 2 diabetes, and really focus on what we can learn from bariatric surgery so that we can develop new treatments, because clearly we can't operate on everybody who fulfills the current criteria. So just to give you some stats, which you know already, that actually the number of people worldwide with obesity is increasing, and it's now 13%. Clearly, in different countries, it's higher than that. In the UK, it's 27%, and here in New Zealand, obesity rates are higher at about 30%. Well, why does it matter? Well, it matters because obesity is a lifelong chronic condition that comes with a whole host of other diseases that decreases somebody's quality of life, but also means that they live for a shorter period of time. We know that for each five point increment in BMI, a person's chances of dying of cardiovascular disease increase by 40%. We know that people who have obesity Oops, now we go. Live less time. So, for somebody with a BMI between 30 and 40, their life expectancy is reduced by at least three years. And by the time somebody has a BMI of 40, then their life expectancy is reduced by 10 years. And one of the biggest problems or associated diseases with overweight and obesity is type 2 diabetes. And the actual frightening statistic is that one person dies every six seconds related to type 2 diabetes. And I don't think that as a global problem we've really got hold of this, that we don't spend enough effort really focusing on diabetes as much as we do other diseases. And this problem is only going to get worse unless we really wake up and people stop thinking, oh, I've got a touch of diabetes. It's not a touch of diabetes, it's a serious condition that is actually killing people. So clearly we need prevention, but we also need treatment for the millions of people who already have diabetes and severe obesity. So the two go hand in hand, and we can't have one without the other. And obviously prevention is better than cure, but what we also need is treatment and maybe even something that cures these conditions. Healthy lifestyle is absolutely fundamental to both prevention and treatment, because we're never gonna actually get people who have treatment to stay at a lower weight unless we also then change the environment in which they are then trying to live with their treatment. Now, lots of people will say, it's really simple. There's a really easy way to treat obesity. Just eat less, exercise more. Now, if it was that simple, none of us would be sitting here. We would all be doing something else and we wouldn't be having a diabetes ep epidemic. So why isn't it that simple? Einstein thought it was. 
What's the problem? Well, there's a very complex biology, some of which other speakers have touched upon already, that actually eating is so fundamental to our existence that we have multiple systems that make sure that we do it. And more importantly, eating is exceptionally enjoyable. And all of the sort of companies that make their money from eating really act upon that part of food enjoyment, making it as tasty as possible, as attractive as possible, and advertising it to us. So part of the problem is that we have multiple systems that make sure that we eat if food is available. Now, our understanding of how appetite is regulated has massively increased over the last 10, 20 years. But that still hasn't then fed back into the idea that it's somebody's fault, that somebody's overweight or obese purely because they lack willpower. Well, that goes against what we're learning in terms of science. So we know that there's a whole panoply of signals that come from the periphery that tell your brain whether you need to eat or not. But most of those signals are saying, eat. We have hardly anything that says, stop eating. And that's part of the fundamental problem. So the gut is really well placed to signal to your brain what you've eaten, because it's the first point of contact. So as soon as you eat, there's a whole host of signals, hormonal, neural, that start sort of being activated to prepare your body to actually digest the food that you've just eaten and also to prepare yourself and work out when you need to eat again. But again, most of these signals don't really particularly stop you eating in the long term. But not only do the signals from the gut regulate appetite, they also regulate your blood sugar. And this is really important in terms of thinking about bariatric surgery. Because what bariatric surgery does is it replumbs your gut and it replumbs all of these signals. And that's part of the reason how it works. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So, as Jeremy said, I'm sort of known as Mrs. PYY. Now, back in 1999, PYY was just thought to be a signal that came from the gut that slowed gut transit. But what we did know about it is we knew that when a person eats, the levels of PYY in the, gut, in the blood go up. But they don't just go up and come down, they stay elevated for up to 12 hours after you've eaten. And we know that the levels go up depending on how much you've eaten. So if you eat a small meal, they go up a little bit. If you go from all sort of course buffet as much as you can eat, then they go up a lot. And if you eat a huge amount, you start to feel <coughs> sick. And that's PYY saying, hey, stop, we're full down here. So on the basis of this observation, I did some studies to say, well, if we give this to sort of mice to start with, does it actually stop people eating? So is it a satiety factor or what's it doing? So one of the first studies we did was we did a double-blind placebo crossover study in lean people and also people with obesity to see what happens if we give them this hormone. They didn't know which hormone they were. They didn't know if they were having placebo or this hormone. What we found is it decreased hunger and decreased the amount of food that people ate. And we did that in normal weight, lean and obese. And not only did it decrease the meal that we gave them in the study, it decreased food intake for 24 hours afterwards. The other surprising thing that we found is that once a person has become obese, then the levels of this hormone go down in the blood. So once you're an obese adult or child, then the amount of PYY drops. So your brain's not getting the proper signal. So you eat a meal, your brain doesn't think you've eaten as much as you have, so you still feel hungry. So obesity is actually a condition of PYY deficiency. Now, does that predispose to obesity? Well, the way that we can test that is to make mice that lack PYY. And when we make PYY knockout mice, they eat more, and by teenage years, which is represented by my slide cut through MRI scans, the mice are already obese. So white on this slide is fat, and as you can see, there's far more fat in the PYY knockout mice. So we know that if you have a lack of this hormone, then you're predisposed to eat more and put on weight. 
Now, one of the things we don't know is if we take a group of mice and put them on a high-fat diet and make them obese, then their PYY goes down. Now, we don't entirely understand why that is. So once a person's become obese, their PYY levels go down. If we then take those mice and make them thin, we don't correct the PYY. So once you've become obese, you get a deficiency in your PYY, and losing weight, unfortunately, doesn't reset it. Now, if we give PYY chronically to animals, then we decrease the amount of fat. The same is true in humans, and at the moment, PYY is in phase two studies with Nova Nordisk to see whether it can be given um, as a treatment for obesity. The problem is it's a peptide again, so it has to be given parenterally as an injection. So one of the questions we next wanted to work out was, how is it decreasing hunger? So again, this was back in 2006, where the hypothalamus was the place to be. It was the place in research, and if it didn't work there, then it wasn't worth knowing about. So the way that we addressed this was to use functional brain imaging. So what functional brain imaging allows you to do, it allows you to see which part of the brain is activated when you do something. And all we did is we took a group of healthy, normal weight people, and we either gave them a PYY infusion or a saline infusion and imaged their brain. They didn't know which they were getting, and they had both. And whilst we did see activation in the hypothalamus and brainstem, the area that was most affected by simply giving a gut hormone was the reward system. And this was a new finding back in 2006, seven, that actually simply giving a gut hormone activates all the reward areas in your brain. And what PYY does is it actually makes food less pleasant. So when we're giving PYY, we're actually sort of switching off the areas that would make you want to go and eat more. And we're particularly acting on areas of the brain that integrate your external environment with your upcoming sort of homeostatic signals. So it's putting it all together and actually saying, well, actually, I'm not really particularly interested in that anymore. And that's part of the reason. And if we ask people how hungry they feel, or we look at the changes in the brain and then look at how much they eat, it was actually the change in the brain that predicted how much they ate, much better than simply asking somebody how hungry they were. So the change in the brain with this hormone predicted how much they then ate when we gave them a meal when they came out of the scanner. So this was kind of a new idea that gut hormones not only act on your unconscious part of your brain, but they also act more on your reward system. Now, another gut hormone, GLP-1, which comes from the same cells in the gut as PYY, is already being used as a treatment for type 2 diabetes. So predominantly the role of GLP-1 is to regulate blood glucose. But it also has a role on appetite as well. And levels of GLP-1, similar to PYY, are decreased in obesity. And many of you will already know that GLP-1 at a higher dose is now available for the treatment of obesity. It's been approved in America where it's being used. It's licensed in Europe, but not yet available in the UK on the NHS because of cost. So the problem with liraglutide is it's 200 pounds a month. So at a slightly <coughs> prohibitive cost, bearing in mind that obesity is a chronic condition like hypertension, so it's not something you can treat and then stop the treatment because it will come back. But it just shows you that actually gut hormones are getting there in terms of pharmacological arena. Now you've already heard Rinky talk about ghrelin. Ghrelin is dubbed the hunger hormone. And basically if we give ghrelin to people, it stimulates appetite and then causes people to put on weight. It is actually being used in people with cancer to actually treat them for cachexia. So it works for cancer-related cachexia. It doesn't work in anorexia nervosa. So actually giving ghrelin can stimulate appetite in people who need their appetite stimulating. Now, ghrelin has a really interesting biology in that it has to be activated by an enzyme called GOAT by adding on an acyl group. And the predominant circulating form of ghrelin is desacyl ghrelin, which has now been shown to have the opposite effect on appetite. 
So you have acyl ghrelin, which is stimulating appetite and making sort of a pro-diabetic effect. And then we have desacyl ghrelin, which has the opposite. So your goat enzyme, which is controlling what's going on between these two, is actually really quite important. And again, there are lots of pharmaceutical efforts, studies in phase two, giving goat inhibitors for the treatment of obesity and type 2 diabetes. But I'm going to come back to the acyl desacyl ghrelin ratio in a minute. So not only does PYY act on the homeostatic and the reward system, but so does GLP-1, so does ghrelin, and so does every other gut hormone that has been looked at so far. So again, if we could block ghrelin, either by blocking the receptor or by acting on the enzyme, then again, potentially, we can have an impact on weight. Again, this is mice, not humans yet. We now know that gut hormones act on multiple systems. So they act on your brain, they act in your taste. So gut hormones are produced in your saliva and the cognate receptors are present on your taste buds. And again, this is something I'll come back to with bariatric surgery. So if you change circulating levels of gut hormone, you change the gut hormones in your saliva and that changes your taste perception, particularly for sweet and fat. So again, there's a whole sort of integrated system that by eating, you release gut hormones, act on your brain, act on your pancreas, your fat, your muscle, your taste, to produce an integrated response. Now, can we modulate gut hormones at all through diet? So this study was quite a simple study that was actually stimulated by one of my colleagues who said to me at the time, I've been on the Atkins diet, and for the first time, I don't really feel hungry. Have you looked at your hormone in people who are on the Atkins diet? I thought, oh, okay, right, we could do a study like that. So we then looked at the effect of giving different meals on the release of um, peptide YY and other gut hormones in lean people and obese people. And lo and behold, protein is the best stimulant to release PYY. And we did much bigger studies in mice, and if we gave mice higher protein diets, then they ended up with more lean mass and less fat mass. So there is some difference in terms of release of gut hormones in response to protein and fat, and carbohydrate doesn't really particularly release PYY very well. Well, what about exercise? So the study here is looking at the effect of resistance exercise and I'm just working if I can work out the pointer, resistance exercise and also aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise is here. The subjects come in there fasted. They either do aerobic exercise or resistant exercise. And what happens is their hunger falls. Whereas the people who are the... Con so each person came three times. So in the control day, their hunger increases with time because they're coming towards lunchtime and they're fasted. Whereas if they exercise, there's a marked decrease in hunger. And then this is where they have a standardized meal, go throughout the day and then another meal just to see if there's then a later effect. Now, we'd anticipate that the energy used here would lead to an increase in hunger later on. So you'd expect people would then sort of end up in energy balance by eating more because to make up for the energy they've used, but they don't. Now, if we look at circulating levels of acyl ghrelin, so this is your hunger hormone, what happens? You start to exercise, your ghrelin goes down. So aerobic exercise, resistant exercise, cause your ghrelin levels to go down, which is probably causing the hunger, and then they come back up. And if we look at PYY, interestingly, PYY only goes up with aerobic exercise, not resistance. And what we find here is that PYY goes up, but then in response to the meal, then there's a much greater increment in PYY after exercise than if you either have resistance exercise or the control day. So a bout of exercise is actually having a positive effect on your gut hormones in the short term. And this is the same with um, sort of high intensity exercise or cycling, and we've looked in men and women. What we haven't done though yet is looked at high sort of levels of exercise in people with obesity. So what about genetics? Again, you've heard a bit about this and you've also heard about FTO. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about FTO. 
So what do we know about FTO? So we know that people who have two copies of the at-risk SNP in this locus have a tendency to eat more, but also particularly for high energy dense foods. And this is present in children as young as three years old. So in studies done in kindergartens and nurseries, if you leave sort of biscuits on the side in children who've already eaten, the children with the FTO variant at the age of three are the children who will then go and pick the biscuits. If we look at weight gain in our first year students at UCL, based on genotype, the FTO students gain four kilos more during the first year at university than the ones without. So these are small effects, but they're effects that are present across life course. So I'm a gut hormone person. When I first heard this being described in a meeting, I thought, well, it's a gut hormone problem because they're not feeling full. They're wanting to eat more sort of energy dense food. So we designed a study where we basically recruited normal weight UCL students. And we had two groups, a group with the protected genotype and the at-risk genotype. And we matched them perfectly for education, ethnicity, and their body composition. So everything else was kept the same. And then we simply got them to fast and we gave them a meal. And we looked at their gut hormone response after they'd eaten and looked at their appetite. And then we did a separate study when we did exactly the same, but then we also imaged their brain and showed them pictures of food, either when they were fasted or after they'd eaten. And what we found is what was published in the literature, that the people with the at-risk gene, which is the AA group, so they're fasted, we give them a big meal, 2,500 calories, their hunger comes down, but what happens is their hunger comes up much more quickly after this meal. So, and it's quite an immediate effect, so their hunger doesn't suppress, so they've all eaten the relative amount of calories for their energy requirements. And if we look at ghrelin, which is your hunger hormone, if you have the at-risk genotype, then your ghrelin doesn't go down properly in response to eating. And if we then look at how attractive high-calorie foods are in these people after they've eaten 2,500 calories, <coughs> the people with the at-risk genotype still find high-calorie food attractive even though they've eaten. <coughs> And at sort of a molecular level, we did lots of studies looking at the relationship between FTO and ghrelin. And FTO directly regulates the transcription and production of both ghrelin and also the enzyme, the goat enzyme, that's important for activating ghrelin. But then probably the most interesting finding is what we saw when we looked at the brains of people with this at-risk genotype. So their normal weight, and all we're doing is showing them pictures of food. And the people with the obesity at risk genotype, their brain lights up like a Christmas tree when you show them pictures of cake, chips, anything really hedonic, even though they've eaten. And the areas that we're seeing the activation in is all the areas that make you do something. So if you've got the FTO genotype and you look at the dessert menu, you're a goner because you're going to have that chocolate cake. There is no resisting it because your brain is telling you, I'm going to have that chocolate cake. So don't look at the dessert trolley. Don't sit looking at the kitchen, seeing the food coming out and try and stay away from adverts. But it just shows you that this is having a profound effect on how people respond to food cues, which are very prevalent in our current environment. Now, what about exercise? So I told you already that exercise decreases ghrelin. So what we wanted to next do is say, well, does exercise decrease ghrelin in people with the at-risk variant of FTA? So similar sort of study, we take normal weight people and we exercise them. Might help you if I give you the code in there as well, I to know, oops, there we go. So the AAs are blue and the TT, so this is just the control conditions when they're sitting there. And we saw the same that we'd seen before, that after the meal, the people with the AA, which is the at-risk, their hunger comes up more quickly. This is always a good thing to be able to replicate your own published studies, because it's never, it's never a given. Um, so we saw that, but then what we did see is in exercise suppresses um, appetite in both groups equally. So exercise does suppress appetite in people with FTA. Now if we look at the food intake, this is on both the control and the exercise day, then the AAs eat more 
but they don't overcompensate with the exercise. So we haven't reversed this yet, but this is acutely after they've done their exercise. Now, if we look at the ASAR ghrelin, then again, we see that exercise drops the ASAR ghrelin equally in both groups. Now, the most interesting thing that we found was that if we look at the ratio of the active hunger-stimulating ghrelin to the sort of potential one that stops it, that actually in the control state, the AA group have got a much higher ratio of the appetite stimulating to the suppressing one. But exercise completely gets rid of that. Now, we know from epidemiological studies that exercise protects against some of the effects of FTO. And this is probably the mechanism by which it's in part you're doing it. So again, aerobic exercise is a very good message that everybody should be doing. But if you know that you're more at risk, then actually telling people that exercise is a good protective mechanism is something that we should really focus on. And is the same true in obese people? Again, if we look at people with severe obesity, then the same is true, they don't suppress their ghrelin properly, and they have a much higher ratio of the acyl ghrelin to the desacyl ghrelin. So again, with exercise, we can try and ameliorate some of this effect. Now, I'm going to switch a little bit now to talk about the biology of somebody once they've become obese, because it changes. And once a person has become obese, they're in a stuck situation, because they get leptin resistance, insulin resistance, their ghrelin changes, their PYY changes, and all of these things actually predispose you to putting on more weight. So you get stuck in this vicious cycle that once you've become obese, you're more likely to put on more weight. Well, what about weight loss? Now, anybody who works in the obesity field will know that actually weight loss is not the problem. It's weight loss maintenance. All of my patients can lose weight, and often, them, often many of them will have lost my body weight and more before and put it all back on. And this was highlighted in this article in the New York Times when they looked at the biggest loser later on. And this is something that we know from study after study after study. People lose weight, and then they put it back on. Now, this tells you that whatever we do, we have to do it lifelong. You can't just give an intervention and walk away from it because the weight will come back on. And it doesn't matter if you lose this weight through the cabbage soup diet, or if you do it gradually with a more sort of planned program, you're still going to put the weight back on. There's a very, very high chance. So for a man with a BMI of 40, they've got a 1 in 1,250 chance of getting to normal weight. And then they've got a 95% chance of putting all of that weight back on. Now, if you had a BMI of 40, would you try? Or would you think, OK, maybe... What are we going to do instead? But why is that? So again, this is a study that um, was shown a little bit earlier. So this is the effect of going on a very low calorie diet. So what happens? You go on a very low calorie diet, you lose weight, but then you put the weight back on. What happens if we look at hunger? So this is before these people went on the diet. They have a meal, or the fasted, have a meal. Hunger comes down, comes back up. At the end of the 10-week period of very low calorie diet, these folk are more hungry. So they start off more hungry, they have a meal, comes back up. If you look a year later, when they've put the weight back on, they're still more hungry than before they went on the diet. So what happens is by going on a very low calorie diet, you actually predispose yourself to put on more weight. And if we look at the hormones, what happens is you go on a very low calorie diet, your hunger hormone goes up. Food becomes so interesting, it is all consuming. But even when you've put the weight back on, your ghrelin is still up. Your gut hormones, PYY, goes down, so it's low already in a B state. You go on a diet, you make it worse. So what happens with a diet is you're actually making your biology harder and more likely for you to put more weight on. So if we start off with a person who's overweight, they go on a diet, they're really happy, they've lost that weight, great, everybody's congratulating themselves, but they're more hungry. Their energy expenditure goes down, their interest in food goes up, and they end up actually heavier than they were in the first place. And what the challenge is, is how do we keep this person here? How do we stop them from getting to here to there? And even if somebody manages to lose weight and keep it off for two years, three years, that tendency is always there 
to put the weight back on. So once you've lost weight, it's like holding one of those stretchy bands out. You can't let it go. You have to keep trying and trying and trying and trying to maintain your weight loss. And that's one of the really hard things. And patients who have bariatric surgery, who we have to reverse the surgery, even if they've been normal weight for 10, 15 years, if we reverse the surgery, they put the weight back on. So that, again, that's one of the fundamental questions is how do we reset the body that actually it can go back to how it was before a person became obese in the first place. Now to switch to bariatric surgery, so this is the Swedish obese subject study which has generated lots of really good publications and what this slide highlights here is that this is best possible medical management and it is best possible because normally people would put weight on. And this is the effect of bariatric surgery. And what we know is that bariatric surgery causes sustained weight loss on average in people. Now the three main types of bariatric surgery are gastric banding, which is what most people think bariatric surgery is, but it isn't. So lap band only represents about 10% of all operations done globally. We don't do them at all in the centre where I work, we take them out. The most common operation was gastric bypass surgery. This involves basically stapling off the stomach, food passes from the esophagus into a small gastric pouch into the jejunum where it joins the rest of the pancreatic and biliary juices. And then this is the most common operation done globally now, which is sleeve gastrectomy, which involves removing about 80% of the stomach, food passes through the rest of the GI tract in the normal route. Now, both of these two surgeries take about 90 minutes. It's laparoscopic. Patient, our patients go home either the day after surgery or two days later, and they go back to work two weeks later. The actual risk of the surgery is the same having your gallbladder out or your knee done, and give, bearing in mind that this is a high-risk group of patients anaesthetically. So it is safe surgery. I wanted to share with you the sort of patient that I see in every clinic that I do. This is my average sort of man. So this is JW. He's 45 years old. He's got a BMI of 50. He's got type 2 diabetes, poorly controlled, HbA1c of 8. He's already got fatty liver disease. He's on CPAP for his obstructive sleep apnea. He's got bilateral knee osteoarthritis. And understandably, he's a bit cheesed off with life and he's depressed. He's already tried multiple diets. He's been told he needs to lose weight for his diabetes. He's acutely aware of this. His members of his family have died of type 2 diabetes. His kind of what are we going to do with medical management isn't really going to improve his life expectancy. So this is John before surgery. This is John two years after surgery. He's now lost 32% of his body weight. His type 2 diabetes went into remission immediately after surgery, so not related to the weight loss. He's on no medication for his high blood pressure, and he doesn't need his CPAP machine anymore. Now, the changes in diabetes are immediate. So the vast majority of patients will come into hospital on their insulin, on their other tablets. They go home the next day on no treatment. And this is because of the changes in your gut hormones that regulate how um, glucose is regulated in the blood. Now, apart from the diabetes, we know that bariatric surgery also improves all of the other comorbidities that come with obesity. So hypertension, fatty liver disease, musculoskeletal problems are improved because of less weight, improved quality of life of the patient. But also we prevent new type 2 diabetes, 30% decreased risk in having a stroke, developing ischemic heart disease, and that translates into a 30% decrease in mortality. Now, in terms of diabetes, the thing that we're interested in is the complications. And we know there's a 30% decrease in the microvascular complications of type 2 diabetes. So blindness, kidney disease, nerve damage at 10 years after surgery. Now, the number of operations undertaken worldwide has increased, apart from in New Zealand. And as you'll see, there's now at least half a million being undertaken globally. So this is the data for New Zealand. So in 2013-14, there were 889 operations. I've guesstimated your S, sort of how many of your population have got severe obesity. So basically, it's about 0.4% of your eligible population 
that are currently accessing. And I doubt that's really representative in terms of if you look at who are getting the surgery, I suspect it's not representative of the people <coughs> who need to have it. Now, what about good RCTs? There's, been a, there's a lot of epidemiological data, but unfortunately bariatric surgeons haven't been that great at doing randomised control trials. And this is the best of, the, of what's out there, really, which has generated several New England Journal papers. So this is taking people with um, a BMI between 27 and 40, the average was actually 36, with type 2 diabetes. And the HbA1c of this group was 9%, so poorly controlled type 2 diabetes. And they were randomised to either best possible medical therapy, bypass with medical therapy, or sleeve with medical therapy. And the primary endpoint was to get an HbA1c of less than 6, which is fairly optimistic in a group that's starting off with 9, at one year. So what I'm showing you here is the three-year outcome data to start with. And as you'd expect, BMI is markedly decreased with bariatric surgery, more so with bypass than with sleeve. And if we look at HbA1c, again, marked reduction in HbA1c with bariatric surgery compared to best po possible medical therapy. And if you look at the number of diabetes medication, again, a marked decrease in medication. Well, what about the five-year data? So again, the five-year data, which was published in January, again, showing you change in BMI. Again, the bypass group lose more weight. And looking at HbA1c, still improved. But diabetes is a chronic condition, and it does tend to still get worse even after bariatric surgery. But this is kind of the money slide that I'm showing you here, is in terms of the number of people who are not taking any medication. So starting off with an HbA1c of nine, 45% of these patients at five years are still not taking any medication for their diabetes and have normal glucose glycemia. And for the sleeve, it's slightly less. Now, I've told you that sleeve is the most common operation. The direct comparison of bypass and sleeve, there isn't much data out there. But at the moment, most of the data is suggesting that probably bypass is better than sleeve, which is a concern now that sleeve is the operation of choice. Well, what about the folks that don't have remission? Well, even the people who don't have remission, most of them can come off their insulin, which if you're a patient, being able to come off your insulin is a real benefit. So even if we're not looking at remission, actually glycemic improvement is key. And this is a slide that shows the decrease in microvascular disease. The other thing that bariatric surgery does is prevent people getting type 2 diabetes. And again, there's just been a study published showing that the greatest cost effect of bariatric surgery is in the people with prediabetes. So for a patient with prediabetes and obesity, then it actually stops progression to type 2 diabetes. This is just to show you some of the safety data, showing you the 30-day mortality and the complication rate, just to reiterate that this is safe surgery. But there is the downside. We're altering the gut, and patients who have surgery have to commit to lifelong follow-up to have their nutritional status monitored, particularly iron deficiency, B12, calcium, vitamin D, and we have had berry, berry, vitamin A, night blindness. So they require lifelong monitoring. So what are the UK current recommendations? So in the UK, anybody with a BMI over 35 with type 2 diabetes for less than 10 years should have an expedited referral for bariatric surgery. Okay? And we can consider offering bariatric surgery to people with a BMI between 30 and 35 if they have type 2 diabetes. Now, there was a, a consensus summit last year and 49 worldwide organisations, diabetes organisations, all again signed up to the fact that bariatric surgery should be part of the treatment algorithm for people with type 2 diabetes. And this is what Diabetes UK say about it. Surgery must be recognised as part of the treatment option for people with type 2 diabetes. Now, what we now know, and so I'm just going to finish off by talking about mechanism for a bit, is that this surgery is not working just by causing restriction, because banding causes restriction, so does wiring somebody's jaw. What it does is it works by changing hormones. So 
not only are there the benefits to the individual that I've just told you about, but there are the benefits to wider society. If we can understand how bariatric surgery works, then what we'll end up with is new treatments for obesity and also potentially be able to put diabetes into remission. So there are the individual benefits, but there's the much wider benefits. So what we do with our patients is all of them get involved in research. We do detailed phenotyping, we take their genetics, we take all of their tissues at surgery, which are very easy to collect and buy a bank, and then we image them and get as much information from patients longitudinally to try and work out how is this surgery working. So say we scan them, we look at their taste, we look at their appetite, and we sort of try and work out what are the biological drivers. Now, surgery changes multiple things, and it's a combination of these things that together lead to the success. But if we can really tie and tease apart, what are the key bits? Can we package it up? Can we do this eventually without the surgeons? I'm sorry, I'm seeing you sitting over there, but we're still a way off that. So what about gut hormones? So we know that gut hormones go up after surgery, and we've known this for 20 years. So we've known that after bariatric surgery, there's a marked increase in gut hormones. And there's far more evidence that have looked at this, showing that the gut hormones are playing a key role. I'm running out of time, so I'm flicking through these. And if we do surgery in mice that lack PYY, then they don't lose the weight and they don't end up with the glucose control. Again, showing the importance. And I've told you this already, that you have gut hormones in your saliva and after bariatric surgery, the amount of gut hormones in your saliva goes up markedly and this underlies part of the taste changes that patients report after surgery. So in contrast to dieting, what bariatric surgery does is it changes your biology to allow you to lose weight and keep it off lifelong. And that's part of the reason why it works. But there is variability in this response. There are patients who don't respond well to surgery and there are patients who lose too much weight. This is not the surgeon's fault or the patient's fault. It's biology. And again, this gives us a tool to really understand how appetite is regulated and body weight is regulated. And we know that the people that have a poor response have a poor response in their gut hormones after surgery. And we also know that the people who have an extreme weight loss have very exaggerated response in their gut hormones. So again, for people who do look after people with bariatric surgery, the ones that have a low effect or too much, don't blame them, think about the biology because that's what's underlying it. Does the weight loss matter? It does, because we know that actually in the longer term, that for every additional 1% weight loss, there's your type 2 diabetes remission chance increases by 10%. So we actually really need to try and maximise weight loss after surgery. So once a person's had surgery, we need to give them the proper tools and the proper lifestyle advice to make sure that they can actually lose as much weight as possible. Otherwise, they will just go back to eating less of a terrible diet, whereas what we need to do is support them to change their lifestyle completely. So one of the things that we're doing is collecting genetics and outcomes. So we've got DNA now from 4,000 patients with outcomes looking at can we look at genetic predictors as who's going to do well? Can we select the people beforehand who would do well when we've got such a limited resource? And yes, we can. And we're identifying new genes and new pathways by using this approach because looking at the response to surgery gives us new clues. So medical bariatric surgery, we can either do this, oops, we can either do this through giving a combination of drugs but again, remembering this is lifelong and it will be expensive. Or the better approach is to try, actually try and target the, your gut hormones cells to reset them so that they can produce their own. And we've got a long way in our understanding of these little cells that produce these hormones. And I think that actually we probably will get there, but not for probably five to 10 years time. Another option is devices. So the endo barrier and also something called duodenal mucosal resurfacing are other techniques that are trying to target the gut to treat obesity and type 2 diabetes. So there's a lot going on in the actual gut space. So my take home messages, that actually overweight and obesity are a normal response to our current environment. And there are very powerful biological drivers that underlie this. 
Bariatric surgery has unparalleled health benefits and we really need to use this for the people who need it, where weight loss and lifestyle really aren't going to work and that therapies aimed at targeting the gut really are tractable. And I think we really need to get home this message that obesity is a chronic disease. It's not the patient's fault. We need to get away from the blame to actually treating people and supporting them lifelong in terms of weight loss. We need to manage obesity in the same way as any other chronic illness. And then my final slide is we need to empower our people who are affected by overweight and obesity. I looked to see if there was a patient empowerment group in New Zealand for people affected by overweight and obesity, and I couldn't find one. And the problem is they are a group of people who feel that it's their fault. Healthcare professionals make them feel like it's their fault, so they often don't have a voice to go to government and say, we need more bariatric surgery, we need more weight care in primary care, and that's one of the things that as professionals we actually have a duty to do as well is to empower our patients so they have a patient voice so that we can actually do what they want us to do. Final slide is acknowledgements and I'm sorry I've got one minute left. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I'm sure you'll all agree that was a uh, powerhouse talk uh, of uh, mechanisms underlying obesity treatments and the gut, etc. Just absolutely fantastic, and thank you very much. And uh, clearly, this is what you can do when you haven't had very much sleep for the last 48 hours. Um, so that's great. Um, we've got time probably for just one burning question. So the first person, Rod, got his hand up first. So uh, over to you. So um, when you were talking about criteria. Well, within the within the UK, there's 2.6 million people who are eligible, but not everybody wants it. So it's an basically that's an assessment for. So it's to give people an informed decision, and we only undertook 6,000 last year. So actually, in terms of the number of people accessing surgery within the UK, it's terrible as well. But it's actually for the people who are really stuck. It's how do you then sort of do that? But I think the numbers that you're doing at the moment. I mean, yeah, no, I know. Surgery for possibly a third of a whole population group, I think, is pretty scary stuff. Yeah. Well, I think you should see it the other way around, is actually the people who would benefit from it, but also learning from it to actually then try and find something that you can then use on the whole population. Because clearly, everybody can't have surgery, and most people don't want it. It is a fairly scary thing to commit to. Right. Thank you very much if you can join to thank Rachel again for a wonderful talk.